Hey, welcome to the Backyard Professor Videos. We are here on Sunday night, and we have Dan Bogle in the house again. We're going to be talking about the first vision in Freemasonry from the book, where did I put it? Method Infinite. So let's get this show on the road, and let's imagine that we want to have some fun tonight learning some cool stuff. <laughs> Tonight is a good night. We've got Dan Bogle in the house. Uh, I would like to make a special announcement first, if I may. I'm going to I'm going to scroll this around the bottom for just a few minutes. I am starting a new series of podcasts on my backyardprofessor.org. And I am exploring in 30-minute clips or so the various and variegated interpretations of God. I'm going to begin in Mormonism, and I'm going to compare and contrast all of the various ways. You can't believe how many different ways God has been interpreted from Joseph Smith on, even continuing to today, even though they've tried to harmonize it all. So I've got that new series going on that is really, I've been getting feedback. I've had the fourth one up I posted today, yesterday. And I've been getting some really good feedback on that. So you're welcome to come to the backyardprofessor.org and have a listen. I've made them so that they're about a half an hour or so, so they're not too long and they're easy to listen to on your way to work or if you're out in the yard or if whatever you're doing, if you want to just get away from the kids and listen to the big kid, however you want to do it. So anyway, that's my announcement. Uh, I do have some really superb guests coming up, but right now... Let's see this really superb guest that I've got, and therefore, I'm going to have to open up the channel to our beloved Dan Vogel, who is just combing his hair. Let's see if we can catch Oh, he's already got it combed. <laughs> hey, welcome back, Hello. Dan. Hello, Gary. How's it going? You know, it has been a busy, busy week and weekend. I'm very excited. Uh, a lot going on. Good stuff coming up on future episodes starting right here, right now. Uh, we have a fabulous program that thanks to your good efforts, we have put together uh, some excellent slides. So I am really looking forward to what you have to say tonight. And it looks like uh, it looks like we've got some people in. Uh, are you seeing comments being posted? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I'm just, it's real interesting that the, the head picture, the opening picture on the podcast did not show up. So I just want to make sure that we're broadcasting. I think we are. So I anyway. see everything, everything's out there. Okay. I don't see any new comments just recently. So except you, you seem to have started a little late uh, on the screen, my screen anyway. Uh, so it's not, the timing's off a little bit, it, it looks like, but Oh, that's interesting. There. All right. Well, good. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I just want to make <laughs> Glad sure. Glad to be back with you all. <laughs> we are thrilled to have you back. So, uh, did you do? Hey, 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 a question real quick. I know the audience is going to want to know. And uh, now we can get you uh, to give a good plug for your. You are in the process, or have you finished that uh, second video that you said you were going to be making? Did you get that done? I'm. I'm nearly done working yeah. on it slowly. I'm that also doing this. 
And boy, you have been putting in the hours on this one, and we're going to very much appreciate it. So it's good. Been well, I, I just want my audience to know they have yet more good material to look forward to from your mighty talented brain, mind, and soul. That's <laughs> what we're all about, right? Brain, mind, and soul. So. All okay. right. Everybody's here. Radio Free Mormon's here. Hi, Radio Free Mormon. Awesome. Wonderful. <laughs> For some reason, I'm not getting the comments. That's kind of weird, isn't it? David well, Cassidy. <laughs> I guess I'll miss out. If anyone asks questions, I'm not going to see it, so I'm safe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. Let's see what have you got to share with us tonight. Oh, all right. So as usual, we're going to start by considering some of the comments that Cheryl gave in the last session when I was busy talking and I couldn't respond to everything. So I'm going to take the opportunity now, but uh, it's going to be really profitable because now we're going to actually have a chance to look at the documents we've been talking about uh, pertaining to the Smith's membership in the Masonic lodges of Canandaigua and Palmyra. So uh, our, if we go to our first slide, let's see how that works. <laughs> Is that the first one? No, that's oh, not it. Not. Sorry, I didn't turn them back. I apologize. <laughs> there we go. Man. No, that's not it. That's the last one. Oh, for Pete's sake. <laughs> one more. <laughs> I promise I was more not coordinated. That huh? This is the first vision. We're going to the Masonic Records. Oh, no it should wonder. be oh, there you are that's there it is. technological yeah. superiority here folks yeah instead of holding it up to the camera I, we can actually uh, look at it without it uh, moving <laughs> there we go very good this is oh so, awesome. you see uh, the second person there is joseph smith with the big arrow towards it yeah. and it shows across the column uh, canandaigua as the place of residence but everybody is in Canandaigua, and we'll talk, discuss that a little bit. Um, where And it says uh, initiated in 1817 and passed and raised in the following year in May. So Cheryl commented, um, all the men on the record were marked as coming from Canandaigua, even though it can be shown that several of them lived in different towns. And this is the statement that's actually in their book. On page 34, a similar statement is, the 1820 census, however, lists two of these men as living in nearby Gorham with others of unclear residence. So with that, they want to argue that uh, since they're not really a resident of Canandaigua, uh, the secretary may have just wrote everybody as being a resident in Canandaigua, even though they weren't, um, that leaves open the possibility that our uh, Joseph Smith over there in um, Palmyra could be uh, that Joseph Smith, even though he wasn't really a resident of Canandaigua. But if true, that would only prove that one of the nine Joseph Smiths didn't reside in Canandaigua. So we, we have nine Joseph Smiths, possible Joseph Smiths. In, this is just in Ontario. It's altogether possible that the Joseph Smith moved to another state. You know, it's like we're assuming that it's a, uh, someone that lives nearby. Um, and uh, they want to argue that it could be our Joseph Smith, although they're they start their discussion, as we'll see, a very uh, affirmative uh, statement. Um, so um, the problem here is that when you use the 1820 census, doesn't show these men, where these men were living in Gorham in 1817. So the two Joseph Smiths that they found living or two, pardon me, two members of the lodge on that list, and they don't tell us which ones, um, were living in Gorham, two of them, 
it doesn't show in eight, it shows them in 1820 in Gorham, but it doesn't mean that they were in Gorham in 1817. So oh, that's a three year gap there is what you're saying. So people move around. And in one history I read yeah. said that um, the uh, Canandaigua Lodge, the on Lodge Ontario, the Ontario Lodge, it was called at that time, it was renamed the Canandaigua Lodge. Uh, uh, 294. Um, the Ontario Lodge 23 uh, had problems with finances due to the transience of some of its members who would borrow money and move away. And so there were people moving around at the time, understandably, uh, be, and they would be attracted to a place like Canandaigua, a major center, and then move out from there. Um, and Joseph Smith Sr. is a good example of this moving around. In our next slide, there mm -hmm. we are. So what you're looking at here yeah, is it? at the top of this blue line, this is, a, you know, we're going to be driving about four minutes south here, <laughs> which is actually <laughs> 1.6 miles. But what the starting point is at the west end of, Palmyra Main Street, where the Smiths once lived when they first moved to Palmyra. And Joe Smith Sr. arrived in 1816, and the rest of the family arrived during the winter sometime when the snow was deep. And, but then in about 1820, uh, they moved south to this farm that we are familiar with in Manchester. Down there, that red arrow? Yeah, at the very bottom. Okay. Uh -huh. That's the Smith family farm, right? Presently, you can go there and look at everything, and it's been reconstructed pretty well. The gold plates are there? Except those. <laughs> Darn it, man. Uh, the Urim and Thummim? Is it there? No. Did they get any... Uh, Angel Moroni? No angels. No angels. Okay. All right. Well, everything else is there. And a few salamanders. <laughs> <laughs> Those just are kidding. outside. <laughs> just kidding. So um, that's about 1.6 miles. This, beca this becomes important because so during the time that we're talking about, Joseph Messina is one of the people that moves. You know, people are moving. And so uh, by the 1820 census, there they have him located uh, at the south end of this line. So, um, well, he wasn't the only one that you know. He, th that was when they were talking about pretty big economic hardships. There was a lot of stuff going on then, so that makes sense that people yeah. are moving around. Yeah. That's the whole reason why he moved to to New York was that they were having fi uh, three failed crops, you know, yeah, yeah. back in um, Vermont. And, and so, none of their farms were really developed, so they had to constantly clear every time they moved to someplace. So, well, th yeah, this was un unsettled uh, forest yeah. land um, that they eventually bought, contracted for their land in 1820. So, but. Um, the uh, Method Infinite incorrectly describes Smith family living on the Palmyra, Ma pa Palmyra Manchester border. Okay, so at the Smith farm is located at the top of Manchester Township, which is about six miles square with a village of Manchester in it. And Palmyra is about six miles square up above that this this line and the smiths lived right on the line practically yeah. or just over the line which became a farmington it was farmington township and in 1823 it became manchester township so in townships are generally six miles square nowadays when they mm -hmm. they divided them subdivide them they ended up being about six miles square and um, 
so Palmyra is the Palmyra village in Palmyra Township. So um, And I have to apologize uh, to the audience. I can't see any of your comments. I don't know why my comments part isn't working. I also can't see how many people are viewing this uh, session at all. There's something unplugged or goofy with my particular side. Maybe that's why the picture didn't show. So people are still writing comments, Dan. Oh, yeah. Like uh, oh, Gail okay. we're, we're being broadcast. I've never Sorry. been up there. Yeah, I can't. I can't see anybody at all, which really is too bad. But that's the way it goes. I wonder if I click off this and then try to get back to the comments. I really don't see anybody. Yeah, it stopped at my last comment. So anyway, just just to know. Otherwise, I would be scrolling comments across as you make them. But I oh can't. yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I, I see this one. And I can show that one. We still have seven. But see, that's a comment. That's a comment. And it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's John Ross Barsky. And then mm -hmm. there's me being a smart aleck. We love the natives. Stay calm, fast, pray, and obey. Or wait. But that's the last one I see. So anyway, huh. I'm not trying to ignore everybody. Just enjoy yourselves as Dan comments i'm not trying sometimes to it freezes up on me and you have to do something does to it? Un yeah, there's, there's un un to freeze it. it okay well anyway okay keep going sorry to interrupt you that's quite all right um so when the smiths arrived in palmyra so we're going to get a little history too they arrived Good. in palmyra uh they lived at the east end at least joe smith senior did and then he moved to the west end and then he was working um, uh, with a Jeremiah Hurlbut at the West End, just on the farmland up there. And then they had some kind of dispute, and they sued, got, they sued each other. And then Justin Senior moved down to uh, near to this cabin that was already in existence, uh, owned by uh, Jennings. Um, are we still uh, on the right slide? Samuel Jennings. And they lived in this cabin, and they the cabin's been reconstructed there also, but it's just uh, north of the line. It's not on their property. They built another cabin on their property, and that's a whole other dispute. But um, they, lived, they moved down there, and then they finally contracted for the land when it became available, and it didn't become available until 1820. Uh, so... You see, when we <laughs> when we look at the next chart from Method Infinite uh, on page thirty five, we we find this chart, and there's several problems with this chart that they that they. No, wrote. sir, I don't see yeah. any spelling mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, first of all, the the mo most noticeable one is the Mount Moriah Lodge number one twenty three. It's like it's one twelve. It's supposed oh, to be 112, Mount Moriah Lodge, 112. Um, okay. But this uh, Farmington is the Smiths, and they eight miles distance from Ontario Lodge down in Canandaigua. We're going to discuss that. Eight, how they got eight miles is kind of a mystery that I'm going to try to t give two solutions to how they got eight miles. But it's not eight miles. It's much more than eight miles. It makes it look a lot shorter and so their argument is um their argument is uh the most obvious uh, feature of this list they say you know on page 35 is that in 1820 the closest man to ontario lodge 23 was none other than r joseph smith senior who was enumerated in farmington okay it is a bit Think about this. It's a bit inconsistent to argue that the closest Joseph Smith must be our Joseph Smith, while at the same time acknowledging that he didn't choose the closest lodge to him. Hmm. So he, they didn't. Yeah. So he's he's the closest to Canandaigua. So we're worried about distance and the closest person, but yet. This guy 
uh, doesn't go to the lodge in his own village. Instead, he, he goes the, uh, to Canandaigua. So you're arguing on one hand, the closest guy, and then on the other hand, he he's not concerned about the closest lodge. Oh, <laughs> that, you know, if he was worried about not traveling too far, then he would have went to the one in his own village. And there's no there's no rule. Once you have uh, you argue that the secretary wasn't writing uh, the correct places where these guys lived and th that this Joseph Smith in, in the Canandaigua record didn't li actually live there. He could live uh, anywhere and doesn't have there's no rule that has to be the closest guy. Right. It could be anybody or it could be some guy that uh, moved, like I said, to another state or another county that we're not even considering. So well, I was just, uh, when I was writing up these, uh, re on these records in my early Mormon documents, I mentioned that there were nine in Ontario County just to show, you know, how confusing it would be. And yeah. for, for me, I was uh, uh, assuming that the person actually lived in Canandaigua and moved away and you, and you wouldn't know who it was really okay. by the 1820 census there's no Joseph Smith in Canandaigua by the so 1820 census yeah the 1820 census so the 1817 record this whoever that Joseph Smith was that um, moved away if they had lived in Canandaigua, but if they never lived in Canandaigua and their secretary was being sloppy, then you have at least nine guys, you know, right. that right. that could could travel there. If they're all traveling, if anybody's traveling, it, it doesn't have to be the closest guy. It's, there's no rule. But right. we're going to look at that, how uh, in the minds of the uh, authors here, it seemed to carry some kind of weight, but that that argument is somewhat uh, weak because it's not. It's more than eight miles, as we'll see in our. Well, the second a couple of other things I want to point out on this list. They have two Joseph Smiths from Benton. Okay, well, uh, there's only one Joseph Smith as I see it, in Benton. And right below that, Joe Smith, was a James, J-A-S. The first one was J-O-S, Smith. And then the the person below that was J-A-S, James Smith. Um, there wasn't two Joseph Smiths there. Not the way I read it, and I, unless there's some Joe it Smith. must be handwritten. Huh? somewhere else, because I looked at all the pages. And I didn't, couldn't, couldn't find any other uh, person that would match it, but that's that should be the second. This the the ninth Joseph Smith is actually um, should be Ontario, and that's twenty five right. miles um, from Canandaigua. That that bottom one. Uh, or the second at the bottom one, they have 20 miles. Is that what you're you said? Yeah. 25, yeah, which would be the furthest person. Oh, well, okay. actually, these should all be probably, I don't know, recalibrated, but um, okay. So, the Ontario, well, he lives in a see if you, yeah, the second one says Ontario, the Rising Virtue Lodge, right? That guy probably had a lodge. I, I don't know the dates of any of these lodges. I haven't like researched to see if that's correct or not. Um, You're not being a lazy learner like uh, President Nelson accuses us all of being, are you? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're about the most learned learner here, man. We, we have to, you have to keep coming back to these documents all the time. Sure. You, and there sure. you, you learn different things. You ask different questions. Uh, and we live in the internet age. So instead of going through reels and reels of microfilm, looking at all this stuff, you can actually go to uh, family search is where I go to most often because it's free. Uh, Excellent. And, yeah. and uh, you can go right, you, 
you put in a search and you can just push one button and you can look at that census page like boom. <laughs> I mean, it's so easy. Yeah, we live in a great age for this. Yeah. 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 Real uh, Mormon history comes out now. Pardon? Real it, Mormon history comes out now. Yeah. 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 In our age. Well, yeah. Yeah, we're progressing in, in this yeah. uh, subject, you know? Yeah. Um, so then how did they get this eight miles though for just Smith senior? It should be 14.1 miles at least. Um, so the next slide will show that. So that's the West end of main street. They would have to go to the East end and then down the Canandaigua road. And they would go down the Canandaigua road and pass through uh, Manchester and Shortsville and reach Canandaigua. And that's, as you can see, 14.1 miles. For us, it's 21 minutes. But um, so and they, that's... And they, and they said eight? Here. They said eight. Eight. Okay. So how would they... How, okay. how did they get eight? So I don't know, but I have a couple of guesses. Okay. And I could be wrong. Cheryl can correct me. Uh, as yeah. to how they get eight. Be on here in two weeks, and she probably will. So it's good. Yeah. <laughs> so she take a note of this or write and a she, note. If she's it's, in the chat tonight. She. Can, I don't she see her. I don't uh -oh. see her. She can harp at you, and then two weeks from now, you can harp at her. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. So the next That's slide cool. here. Cool. Possible reason number one. All right, let's see. She uh, actually went to the village of Farmington and measured Farmington to Canandaigua, which would be, if you took the probably the oldest route, would be 8.1 miles. So that's one thing, because, okay, here's the village. So uh, Farmington and Manchester were one township in 1820. Right. And in 1821, man, uh, Farmington was divided and uh, if you can visualize it, on the left became Farmington with Farmington, uh, Farmington Township with Farmington Village in it. And on the right, the six mile square became burnt actually in 1821. And then in 1822 or 23, it was changed to Manchester with Manchester village in it as the, you know, the main village. So uh, when you read the, the 1820 census and it says the Smiths are being enumerated in, in Farmington township, this is what it meant. It didn't mean Farmington Village. So some people get that confused, townships and villages. And so if they met, they just went to Farmington and put in the directions to Canandaigua, they would get this, <laughs> you know? So that's okay. one possibility. Okay. Okay. Um, then the second poss possible reason number two for the eight miles is, okay, so this is, the, what you're seeing in the center is the Canandaigua Lodge, 294. It's, oh, it's now. Much, it's much smaller than I had envisioned it. That's that's fun to see. Where'd you get that picture? Did you take that one? Off of Google. Oh, okay. From a street you view. You cheated and went to technology. Street, street view. <laughs> So uh, th this is uh, the, and it's located in Shortsville for some reason. It, at one time it was located in, in uh, Canandaigua, actually. Um, oh. I figure that maybe the land, because it's uh, at the top of one of the Finger Lakes and it's a resort area. And I've stayed there many times when I'm doing my research in Western New York, uh, right there at at the top it's kind of a pricey area right so yeah, they it might have uh, went to a cheaper location ended up in shortsville or some one of the main guys lived in shortsville maybe but um it's kind of halfway between a little less than uh halfway between um, palmyra and canandaigua but 
Um, So it's quite possible. It's 21 Canandaigua Street. It's on Canandaigua Road, this this new lodge on the way to Canandaigua. Um, and it's 12 Canandaigua Street. And, and I went on the website, uh, the lodge's website uh, online, and they gave the address of the lodge. And that's how I found this. Yeah. And then... Um, so if you look on the left, this is a Smith family at the west end of, uh, at the uh, we, uh, west end of Main Street, and it would be seven miles to this uh, lodge where it's presently located. So I'm surmising, well, maybe they thought it was always there. Oh, I see you're thinking. Okay, interesting. Maybe they thought they, they just looked up the Canada Lodge 294 and they found out the present location and they thought it was always there somehow. Um, and they called it Canandaigua Lodge, but it wasn't really in Canandaigua. But there's all sorts of histories that mention it being in, in the village of Canandaigua. Um, the Ontario Lodge and the Canandaigua Lodge when it... The, the uh, Ontario Lodge 23 uh, became closed or forfeited its charter um, in 1832. And then in 1851, they reestablished it uh, under the name of Can the Canandaigua Lodge 294 uh, in the village of um, Canandaigua. And they at first met in the what was called the Old Ontario Lodge. And then they moved to some other block and another block. And then they finally came back to the Ontario Lodge. And then at some point, I haven't tried to find out, they moved to Shortsville. So on, on the right is, um, oh, I'm sorry. The, one, the one on the left is the one from their farm. Because the right, authors right. of uh, Method Infinite believe that they were on the farm. So I measured that as if that's what they measured. And that was seven miles. And then from Main Street, it would come out to be 8.2 miles. 8.2, yeah. So that's my speculation. Uh, okay. Possible. It'll be interesting to see when I get Cheryl on the show what she says. Be but it is 13 some odd. It is, it is farther than eight though. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you that chart, if you look on that chart, it's uh, Seneca is eleven miles, which is less than thirteen miles. So they're not just Miss Seniors, not the closest. In fact, okay. And then the one in Menden is fifteen, so that's just a few miles more. And Richmond is fifteen, and Benton is sixteen. So. You, you have people that are, uh, yeah, there you are. You have people that are relative distances that do really uh, don't m amount to much difference. But you have, but in the end, our Joe Smith Sr. is not the closest. The Seneca Joseph Smith is closest. This one, yeah, the second one down. Yeah. Can so you see him? Can you see my pointer on that, or is that just me seeing that? I'm I'm running the cross. I don't center. see your pointer. Oh, oh, that's probably just me then. That's for me. Okay, very good. Okay, so three. There's where we were. Hey. Okay. So um, next slide. Next slide. Okay. So uh, Cheryl says, um, uh, and we also don't say Justice Smith Senior was definitely a member of that lodge, but that it, he was likely, he was likely a member. And uh, they say he does appear on the records of Ontario Lodge. Number so 20. this is the first sentence of the, their treatment of this subject, uh, of this Canandaigua right. record. And, right. uh, it, and it's a common overstatement of the evidence. I see it everywhere. I see it. Uh, 
and it doesn't matter who it is, the Mormon historians, critics, everybody makes it a positively, that's Joseph Smith Sr., you know. Um, so this is a sentence, a search of the Mount Moriah Lodge records has not revealed the induction of Joseph Smith Sr., but he does appear on the records of the Ontario Lodge number 23. So it, it's it's stated without qualification. Maybe uh, they should say something like, but, but, the Joseph Smith listed in the 1817-18 returns of the Ontario Lodge 23, which met in Canandaigua, might be him. You know, some sort of thing like that. And it would clear up the whole uh, overstatement problem. Um, but it's a common, um, even though they did explore the nine Joseph Smiths and they did bring it up, which is more than what they usually do <laughs> when they talk about Joseph Smith Sr. being a member of, of the Mount Moriah Lodge. I mean, okay. the, you see Canada, the footnote uh, 76. Ontario Lodge, sorry. Yeah. Pardon? Do you see the footnote 76? Yes. They're saying, they're saying, they're quoting your early, he points out that the Dan Vogel has argued that this Joseph Smith was unlikely to be the father. That's what you're arguing. He points out that the Ontario Lodge record lists the initiate as living in Canandaigua that Joseph Sr. would more likely have joined the lodge in Palmyra and that there were nine men with the same name in Ontario. That's your early Mormon documents, volume three, page 456. Vogel also notes, however, that the 1820 federal census does not list any person by that name living in Canandaigua, suggesting to his mind that the initiated Smith moved from the area prior to 1820. So, they are they are uh, yeah. recognizing your argument. That's interesting. Okay. Yes, that's good, and that's more than, like anyway. I was saying. That's more than what the other uh, historians do. Okay? okay, they usually don't even mention that. They just make this. They make the first sentence, and then that's usually as far as they go. Now, I'm just saying, if they change that first sentence in another edition or whatever to be more conditional, it would clear up a lot of. Well, My the first hesitation the about this. Of authors is always a rough draft, and so it's always good to you got to get started somewhere. So. Yeah, and this it's is how a great we do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, then Cheryl says, "Okay." Um, says the book discusses why Joseph Senior may have joined a different lodge than Hiram. So, cause I've suggest, I was suggesting that if he, if he had been a member, a Masonic of a, a Masonic lodge, which it's quite possible he was never a Mason. It, it's, that's entirely possible. Um, if he had joined, he would have joined the Mount Moriah lodge and he might've been in the gaps uh, that we have in the records that uh, probably showed Hiram's um, initiation date. So, um, so they say, that, well, why, why would he go so far out of his way? Okay. So that's what we're going to discuss. Um, but they're basing that though, aren't they on this misidentification of the eight miles to the lodge? The closer that's, log. Well, that's which, one of their arguments. Not right, which you've shown is re not really eight miles. It's basically the fourteen or fifteen, or thirteen, so almost not, fourteen, almost fourteen. Yeah, yeah. So you're arguing it's not that he was closer. They're all pretty much the same distance. A lot of them. Some well, of them are yeah. twenty-five miles. It seems a little far. Right, but and that that was this chart here. Yeah. Yeah. The bottom one on Avon is twenty-four miles. Yeah. And 10 Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm so I could get. I could get that. I could dig that as a, a excuse. These guys are too far. Let's eliminate them. <laughs> you know, or something like that. But still, you have one in five, whatever. Okay. Now, if, if you wanted to argue that uh, it, the Joseph Smith in the Canandaigua record is 
was a, a resident of Canandaigua and then moved away by the 1820 census, you can then make arguments for eliminating certain of these Joseph Smiths, like uh, you can eliminate, um, I think I eliminated one, like as in, I was doing, doing an experiment, and I think it was Seneca, um, I think it was Seneca. Anyway, so I went to the 1810 census and the guy was there. So he's oh. there in 1810, 1820. So he wasn't ever living in Canandaigua. You know, he was always over here in Seneca. Yeah. So you could eliminate. But once you say that, oh, this is a sloppy uh, secretary and um, uh, the Joseph Smith Sr. Well, it's entirely possible that the Joseph Smith Sr. was a resident, okay, but of Canandaigua. Uh, just because it, the secretary is being sloppy doesn't mean that you assume the person was somewhere else. Okay, I see your argument. Yep. Yeah, so it starts getting a little murky, but but you, like I said, if you assume that he was a resident and moved away by 1820, you can then start eliminating certain ones. But it would that would also definitely eliminate our Joseph Smith. Hey, the the comments just showed up. <laughs> now I can start posting them. Hey, welcome <laughs> back, everybody, or welcome here. Started with something's happening with your. Well, I'm gonna hurry up and post one of these. So that, okay, and it's working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going, keep going. So <clears throat> finally she woke <clears throat> up. Yeah. Anyway, you can see all the calculations you can make when you're doing genealogy, too. So, sure. you know, I, I've done a lot of genealogy in those five volumes. I looked up everybody's name and tried to uh, pin everybody down to a location and write biographies for all of them. So... It's quite easy for me to think in these kind of uh, ways. Um, so uh, I spent a lot of time at the family history uh, uh, library when that I would travel sense. to Salt Lake City. I would spend my days in the archives. And when the archives closed, after I ate my dinner, I would go and spend the evening at the family history library doing genealogical research on the names uh, in whatever documents I'm working on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so um, so Cheryl says that that in the book they gave reasons uh, why uh, Hiram joined the Mount Moriah Lodge and why Joseph Senior would have gone to another lodge. So we're going to look at those. Okay. But I say, after all, you need a really good reason for Joseph Smith Sr. to join a different lodge than the one his own in his own village where he was living in 1817. There has to be a real good reason for him to bypass that one and go to another one. And you also need a good reason why he was able to overcome the blackball that his being blackballed back in Vermont, which uh -huh. they suggest might be drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting and, episode. Too. And he's drinking. He's a notorious uh, problem drinker, so much so that Hiram, uh, <clears throat> when he was ble when Joseph Senior was blessing Hiram, <clears throat> he blessed Hiram for not scorning him while while he was out of the way through wine. So, okay. uh, so he was no notorious drinker. Uh, the all the you know the accounts of the neighbors talk about him drinking. They all pretty much drank, <laughs> but yeah, but he, he just the senior stood out, you know, yeah. uh, as excelling in that area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know anyway, <laughs> so we're going to look at our first uh, reason number one that the method infinite authors have given us um is that the right slide yes thank you 
Good, good. You bet. Formed in 1804, Mount Moriah was the newer lodge, and it had less time to accumulate the paraphernalia that added luster to the degrees. Now, um, how they know that, <laughs> I don't know how the authors know that, and how Joseph Smith Sr., a non-Mason, would know that either. <laughs> how would he know that? Um, and would it matter to him? This, you know, this, this, this is what I wrote. Uh, this constitutes neither evidence nor sound argument. If it could be proved, Joseph Smith Sr. in the record is our, the Canandaigua record, is our Joseph Smith Sr., then one might offer this as an, a possible explanation for why Joseph Smith Sr. would go all the way to Canandaigua on a regular basis to attend Masonic meetings. So this is not an argument for Joseph Smith Sr. choosing the Canandaigua Lodge. This can't be used as evidence. It's not evidence. It's not even an argument. Okay, but it might be a reason if you could prove it independently by some other means and you go, well, why did he do that? You might offer this as in a reason, but you wouldn't offer this as an argument or evidence to prove uh, Joseph Smith Sr. went to Canandaigua. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, Hey, I just got to say something. Someone says they like my new Beatles haircut. Do I look, do I look like Ringo yet? I didn't even no. know that was. I didn't even know that was a Beatles haircut. I sure can't sing like. Haircut, nineteen sixty-four. <laughs> I'm time traveling, haircut wise. All right, back on to the RG bar. Okay, hair. It's yeah, really fascinating. I think it looks ridiculous, but oh well. <laughs> they they told me to quit combing it back. It made me look too old. So I want to look young, like 29 again. So yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, baby. I got to get that in from Mark Crispin. So, okay. Keep going, man. <laughs> All right. Um, so the Palmyra Lodge was founded in 1804 and was in existence for 13 years before Joseph Smith Sr. supposedly joined the Canandaigua Lodge. 13 years. I mean, they can't get their stuff together in 13 years. I mean, they can't have the paraphernalia. I, I, how can you even have your first meeting if you don't have the paraphernalia? But, uh, you know, oh, yeah. anyway, so I think it's well, a that, week. Put, that would put it right up to 1817, too. 13 years from then, 1804. Yeah, yeah. well, 13 years to get to gather their stuff. And the Canandaigua Lodge was only around a few more years than that. Right, um, right, yeah. 1890, I mean, 1790-something. <laughs> 92, I think it was. 1792. Um, right. Anyway, for we'll go to the next slide for um, oh. argument number two. Argument number two. Here we go. For the this first one, page 33. For those of you who are following, sorry. Well, maybe you can read it. You want me Is to it? read it? Okay, I'll read yeah, it. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> well, I'm having a ball. Are you kidding me? <laughs> For the first few years of its existence, the lodge met alternatively in two towns, Palmyra and Phelps. Had he petitioned the Palmyra Lodge, had he petitioned the Palmyra Lodge, Joseph Sr. would have needed the unanimous affirmative vote of members from two communities for admission and you're going to argue against that well well done um thank you thank you i learned from the best you amigo <laughs> anyway according to an online history it's not an online it's actually written somewhere else put online um okay. of freemasonry in phelps the township phelps written in 1996 by John M. Parmley, Phelps town historian. The practice of meeting in two towns was, dis was discontinued in 1807. Okay. That same year, the Masons in Phelps helped to form the Ark Lodge in Geneva. 
So he would he wouldn't ha he he didn't need their approval of two towns. This is you know kind of anachronistic. Hmm. You're a you're a you're a historical sleuth, aren't you, Vogel? Come on, fess up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. That, that <laughs> is correct. <laughs> And you do it very well, man. Okay, we do uh, n uh, argument number three. Number three. Joseph Sr. would have been required to make periodic trips to the county center to sell crops and deal with land brokers. So the uh, uh, method infinite portrayal of Joseph Smith Sr. making periodic trips to Canandaigua before December 1817 in the December uh, 1817 initiation is anachronistic. So he, he doesn't own a farm yet. He has no crops to sell. He isn't buying any land. Land isn't even available until 1820. So uh, this is anachronistic. Uh, so they have uh, Joe Smith Sr. traveling to Canandaigua for initiation on the 26th of December, 1817, in the winter. Mm -hmm. And then returning uh, the 2nd of May, 1818, to be passed to Fellowcraft, and again five days later to be raised to Master Mason. And they argue that he would only have to go once a month to make this trip. But while Joseph Smith Sr. could have been initiated in late summer or early fall 1817, Method Infinite has him wait until winter. You know, just to make it more difficult. But so it, that seems not a very strong argument. Not at all probable. Uh, it's just anachronistic again. You know, we have again an, another anachronistic argument for not understanding the actual history that's that we do have, let alone the speculation parts. Um, uh, you've, just, you've just been handed a fabulous compliment, and I get to ride your coattails here. I love how these men are the real gold diggers from Jenny 21. <laughs> so congratulations now if we could just cash in i think we ought to start our own church dan what do you say <laughs> no well nobody would join oh yeah people are joined <laughs> you, right? you're the prophet dude we've got electronic communication going on here <laughs> we're in church right now huh there you go right that's there you go <laughs> okay so uh, we'll go to argument number four all right. Our last here argument here. Coming up. Okay. Uh, it's easy to imagine why a young Joe, uh, sorry. It's easy to imagine why a young man such as Hiram would find Palmyra Lodge more appealing than the staid Ontario Lodge. Construction of uh, the Palmyra portion of the Erie Canal, which passed through Palmyra's village center was completed in 1822, increasing the community's importance and the opportunities available to its citizens. There you go. What's wrong with that? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> Ontario Lodges stayed. I mean, how do they know that? And it, it's not that much older than the, the Ma 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 Mariah Lodge, and neither one of them have an actual lodge yet, <laughs> you know? They're all meeting in houses or buildings, or probably uh, rooms, what they called rooms around the, the city. So, uh, so I, the earliest Hiram could have joined was the 9th of February, 1821, when they were uh, on their Manchester land and possibly traveling to Canandaigua. So he's in 1821, they actually have land and they actually have a reason to go to Canandaigua. The real reason Hiram joined the Mount Moriah Lodge had nothing to do with his youth, but the fact that Palmyra was still the center of their activities. 
not Manchester, Seb, 5.7 miles away to the south, and certainly not Canandaigua, 12.7 miles from their farm. Canandaigua was the county seat, and so it was necessary to travel there for land transactions. But the Smiths attended church in Palmyra and conducted business there as well. That was the center of their activities. Now, um, so I don't think any of the four uh, arguments that that Cheryl put forward in her comment really hold any water. They're they're not they're not real reason. They're they're okay. contrived, contrived. Uh, so now we're going to switch to Hiram's membership. And next slide. Uh, yeah. Were we there yet? Oh, there we go. Okay. This That's this is the. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to knock off Teresa Pittman's fun comment. Sorry, Teresa. I want to see the rest of this. I'll put you up another. <laughs> <laughs> so Hiram's is membership is not in question at all. That's what Cheryl said uh, when she was misunderstanding what I was arguing. Um, okay. What were you arguing? I about? think Cheryl's going to like how this turns out, though, with Hiram's yeah. membership. Uh, a little revision going on here with me. Anyway, uh, I never claimed that it was. Uh, you state in the that the Nauvoo Masonic Minutes mention Hiram's previous membership in the Mount Moriah Lodge, but give no reference. They, they don't give a footnote. They mention it. I thought it was odd that they didn't give a footnote. So I'm giving it <laughs> just, okay. just to show everybody, because we're talking about these records. If you want to see the records, here they are. Um, That's the one thing we love about you, man. You, you, yeah. you have a knack for finding the records, man. That's what makes your stuff so dang interesting. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Thank you. I just read uh, your article. Uh, I just read your article a side note in line upon line today earlier on your uh i believe it was the early mormon concept of god i'm doing new podcasts on the infinity and god and the the issues the developments the contradictions yeah. of the mormon god on my backyard professor org dot org and i i just read your article this morning and man you are a you are a bloodhound for sources. I really enjoyed that article. I'd strongly <laughs> recommend everybody reading it. So there okay. you go. I gave you a plug, Vogel. You owe me a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have lots of good uh, research historian friends like Mike Marquardt also that help uh, oh, Mark uh, point awesome. me in, a, in the right direction sometimes. Yeah. I Mike, just talked to Mike last when time. he was around, when he was alive, uh, was helpful. Uh, yeah. a few times in my researches. Um, yeah, Mark Hart's helped me a bit too. I love that man. I just talked to him last night for a little while. He's he's doing good. He's putting out another book. I mean, he just don't quit like you. So you guys just keep on plowing forward. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I learned I learned from him and yeah, the older older. Uh, well, I always admired the kind of. Um, research historians that actually got in their car and drove like so that's what attracted me to wesley walters too was that he actually got in his car during his vacation time and looked for documents and uh, you know and he and ended all, up finding them yeah he found some really good ones oh boy he found some good ones isn't he the one that found the 1826 yeah. uh bills yeah, booker trial yeah bunch of other stuff. Fun, stuff fun stuff yeah and and these guys let me rummage through their files too they have free reign and so it was when i was yeah. in my 20s so uh yeah i've been now, doing this a long time so now a couple of years ago <laughs> <laughs> all right let's get back to serious here so yeah boom um <laughs> so here it says uh the masonic um, minute in, in the church history uh, archives um, for the, the minutes, it's under the 30th of December, 1841. The following members then reported themselves to hail from lodges appending to their names. And there's a bunch of names, but Hiram says, Hiram, Mount Moriah, number 112, New York. 
There you are. So if they should have had that upper one in, in a footnote, it would have been helpful. Uh, a lot of people just talk about it and they never give the reference. Um, so uh, then, okay, the next one, next slide. Coming up. Oh, okay, this up. is the oh, actual oh, Mount Moriah Lodge. Oh, there we in go. the town of Palmyra, County of Wayne. State County of Wayne, New York. state of New York. June, June 4th. June 4th. A.L. Well, it's 1827. AD. They add 4,000 years. Boy, they did, didn't they? Why? They add 4,000 years from the, it's, it's the year of the light. <laughs> oh, I thought they were prophesying about something. From creation. <laughs> from creation. Huh? Oh, um, interesting, yeah. Yeah, get... they did have the young earth uh, thought, didn't they? They had that young earth belief. That's fascinating that they did that. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So, um, to 1828, June yeah. to June. And these are the master, the, the uh, what do you call it, warden? Which warden? Junior warden, senior warden, junior warden, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. past master. Past master, yeah. Uh -huh. So they all owe like 50 cents mostly. And they don't, they, and of course, last time I read it, they don't, they end up not paying it because uh, they were indigent and asked for forgiveness from the Grand Lodge in Albany. But um, where I got these records. Um, okay, so this is. A, Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, right down there with the red arrow is Smith, Hiram. There H he is, our H man. H-I-R-A-M. And it's spelled that way consistently um, in oh, all really? sorts of places. Even his birth record, his birth record, H-I-R-A-M, spelled the same way as Hiram Abith. So... Here's our Hiram. Then um, next slide. Now, this is the same record. The bottom of the page says additional, um, I mean, um, candidates, yes. candidates, yes. newly yes. initiated. And then it gives uh, the names on the top of the next page and the dates when they were initiated. And Hiram's name is not there. This Hiram, and uh, which means this Hir the Hiram mentioned in this record was initiated at another time, not this time. Oh, good, de good detective work. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Okay, next. So this, so this is the whole list of the people who were initiated oh, here then. Yeah, and for the, being initiated, they owed a dollar. <laughs> oh, well, see these dirty rats. They had to pay up. Yeah. Oh, good. That's interesting. All right. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is uh, my summary of the, all the records that uh, I got from the um, Masonic archives. Okay. Chan Chancellor, Chancellor Livingston Library. Um, what we have here, we've got nine separate records dealing with our uh, period of time that's pertinent to our Hiram Smith. And you can see that it's December to December, 1820 to 21 and so forth. And there are missing records. The first one is missing, and that's the first right. uh, earliest Hiram could be initiated. Right, but we right. Don't, we, 1821, yeah. Yeah, and we, in February, we don't have that record. So that's our gap. And okay. then the type of records, re registry, there's no Hiram. And then the next one, it's 1822 to 23 December missing. There's another gap where he could be initiated. 
Um, yeah. And there's no Hiram's until that one it says a dues record. It's a dues record, and it goes from June to June. The, and then we have one more after that, and Hiram's not mentioned. And the authors of the Method Infinite argue that that's because he moved away. So the registries are only list um, initiations, the names of people who were initiated during the last year. Okay. And the dues uh, list everyone, presumably. Right. So you wouldn't expect Hiram to be in these registries. But if he had been initiated in any of those years, he would have appeared. So, would have appeared, so. we only have two spots where he could be initiated. Awesome. And for Hiram, for me, it makes sense that Hiram did join the Masons because he also was... Uh, uh, later, later became a Presbyterian, you know, and he was very well socially connected along with his mother. Um, and okay. it's the kind of thing he would do. So that, that I can imagine. Um, it's a very social thing to try to do. And he was the oldest son, especially after Alvin died. He was the oldest yeah. And aligned with the mother and Presbyterian church, another right. uh, kind of social networking thing to do, whereas Joseph Smith Jr. and Sr. kind of were um, not joiners yeah. <laughs> of anything. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah they well, were kind of, was a senior's brother who uh, threw the Tom, the Thomas Paine book at him and. Yeah. Uh, said here read this for crying out loud that's when lucy was trying to convince him to what was it the methodists wasn't it trying yeah to come to the methodist church and he i guess his brother saw him going and he said oh for pete's sake read that book and what a fun story <laughs> yeah well yeah they and they he he um along with along with asil smith uh and and also um yes it was uh, Jesse Smith that joined uh, the uh, Universalists so that they didn't have to pay pew tax. And, but um, pew tax? Ooh, I wonder if that's how Mormons can get out of their deep debt and make a little more money so they can survive. Yeah. So it was a non-conformist uh, document thing to do, and so Joe Smith Senior didn't join. Church, the church, a church, any church. His right. dreams were that the 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 religious world was dark and Barely. dead. Yeah. To me, that would include masonry. And so, um, hard nose, come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so Hiram's not initiated now. Uh, so our was it the uh, the gaps? Show that one again. Which one? That one, one? Which, yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. So our gaps is that where Hiram probably joined, and we have this uh, record in the Nauvoo uh, minutes, so we know he belonged to that lodge, and so it's a very I mean, there's no question, really, that he's in there somewhere in one of those two slots. But is the Hiram um, on in line eight our Hiram, or is it the other Hiram I mentioned last time? Yeah. And I had mentioned this in the early Mormon documents some, you know, 30 years ago, whatever it was, 25 years. Um, but... I think now after I've done some more research online and it's so easy to do nowadays that the Hiram that I had mentioned before that was listed in the 1830 census that signed that he was also the, uh, um, on the road list, uh, and was the, uh, head of the, uh, I forget what you call him. 
Hey, shall we please one of our uh, viewers here? He's Q-tax. asking he oh. or she, pew tax, please explain. Yeah, I was just sitting in the pew uh, in some of these New England states, You in the pres, in the, in the um, Puritan type churches, congregationalist especially, you had to pay pew tax. And in some states made it mandatory, even if you didn't attend, they would collect pew taxes. And finally, uh, the separation of church and state wasn't so clear in the beginning. And this is one of the th- things in the development uh, in the early American uh, history that if finally was abolished that you couldn't force people to pay pew tax How uh, to, in, to a church. So, um, anyway, uh, so I'm talking about this Hiram, and was this Hiram on line eight here, ours, or the other Hiram? And I did some research, and, and when I did early Mormon documents, I said, most likely this is one of the sons of um, Chubal Smith. Uh, he had three sons on the 1830 census, and one of them would be of age. Well, it turns out that the, when I did the research, I found all sorts of information about this Hiram, this this other Hiram, not our Hiram. And he was bo- would have been born in 1807, which m- would make him not eligible to join until 1828. Okay. Yeah, that would have put him much later. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't imagine that he this other Hiram would appear in this document and not be listed as one of the initiated. Although it's possible the initiations go from December to December and they didn't, they included everybody because it was dues and they didn't include his until the next record, you know, but if you go according to your Bayesian theorem, you know, we're going to go with what's more probable. I would say at at the moment uh, with the, uh, the uh, construction of the records that we have, it would be more weighty on the side of that Hiram is our Hiram in that record. Right. Yeah. And let, yeah. Until we some other... We have to ask ourselves the, the Bayesian question. You brought it up, not me, but yeah. uh, the Bayesian question, is this the kind of evidence we would expect to see based on the theory? And it appears to be so. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, there was only one cho- other choice, which made it easy, you know. Um, so it's there's this slight, slim possibility, but we don't have the documents to prove it. So if you can't prove it, you can't talk about it. <laughs> well, you can talk about it. You, you can, can, but, uh, but, but the weightier side is on the higher one that we do, we do have, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That we do have. So it's most... On, it weighs most likely that this Hiram, but notice the spelling. I'm going to point out. I, I did. I know. So yeah. With the spelling and the yeah. change, why would you Hiram change his spelling and when did he change it? Okay. Evidently, this Hiram was not uh, upset by the Morgan uh, affair. Just like there was, not everybody quit masonry just because of the Morgan thing occurred, you know? Um, and Hiram may. may uh, apparently was not uh, phased by it. But the first time his name is spelt with a Y and then consistently with a Y U M, you know, after this, yeah. right. Um, starts with the testimony of eight witnesses. Yeah. So he may have been convinced by the book of Mormon. Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> Look, yeah, one that's... more influential than we give it credit for. I'm just saying. So that's that's where we stand so on that. So yeah, very interesting. Now that we've done that, we have a few more um, Cheryl Bruno comments that we need to deal with uh, quickly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um. Then why would he come back to no, come back to masonry in Nauvoo? You know, well, you know, he had to change an attitude. The the same as Joseph Smith. 
uh, but not so much a change because if the Book of Mormon is anti-Masonic and then in Nauvoo, he's saying masonry is an apostate endowment, there's not much difference there. But this change took place within a larger change. The U.S. hadn't been taken over by a Masonic conspiracy during Jackson's presidency. Jesus hadn't returned. The Missouri Zion was a complete failure. And just like the book of Revelation and early Christians, prophecy gets reinterpreted. In Illinois, joining Masonry seemed like a smart thing to do. It wasn't like joining another church. It didn't require renouncing Mormonism. And it brought a lot of benefits. So that's where I stand on that. Cheryl then says, Dan would have Hiram join the lodge, then leave the lodge, then come back again. Talk about meta narrative. That's not a meta narrative. As we discussed several times now, a meta narrative is a story about a story encompassing and explaining other little stories within a totalizing schema, if you recall. That's what you have in Method Infinite with just so the you're, you're arguing that the overarching uh, meta narrative is the Masonic narrative. No, that Masonic. Joseph Smith, before uh, while he was a bunny digger, was concerned with masonry and the lost word and the plate of Enoch, and he's going to restore it. And Joseph Smith, they even have Joseph Smith Sr. Uh, telling uh, Paul Myron's that, you know, there's these caverns full of golden treasures, and that's uh, an allusion to uh, the plate of Enoch, and that is was Joseph Smith Sr. more or less telling... Uh, the residents of Palmyra, that his son was going to be the restorer of the lost word and, and restore masonry. And right. that theme starts off and, and goes from, you know, this is what he was intended to do. This is his mission is to purify and restore masonry and religion, which if you remember, uh, he didn't have re the restoring of a religion until in the middle of the Book of Mormon, practically. So, right. um, and then this goes through the whole, his whole scheme. He was meant to restore and purify masonry and, and uh, restore the lost word that, you know, was the uh, cap on his whole career. And that's where he was headed from the very early on. And so that's the meta narrative that I'm talking about. Yeah, and, I just wanted to make sure we were clear yeah, on on your sure. approach to meta narrative. And yeah, very good. Okay. That's the one I think. If they revise that, they can put together the put the book together in a different way and not be so. Um, they're going to get in a lot lot of trouble for this, actually. So, um, so. Uh, Why would they get in trouble for it? Well, I mean, like uh, reviews. Just critiqued. Okay. okay. Yeah, critiqued. That's okay. what. That's what I mean. Okay. Uh, unnecessarily, I mean, in my view, people, it's I unnecessary. I was going to say the great people. I don't want them to get in trouble. <laughs> it might be less satisfying, uh, you know, to have it. Uh, history not have such a thread through it like this a strong thread pulling it through like a very really good story you know um history is not so tidy you know it's it doesn't present itself in these nice narrative fashion um and so yeah it wouldn't be as exciting of a story maybe but it would probably be more historical and more accurate but um, oh, hey, Dan, real quick, we've got a question. I apologize yeah. for interrupting you. Poppy's Jeff Day asks, oh. Dan, could you clarify what this plate of Enoch is that you're talking about? Sorry if I missed it. Okay, well, this is in the Royal Arch degree. degree. Yeah. This is a Royal Arch degree, and it's been known for a long time, way before Method Infinite, that uh, the Royal Arch have this uh, legend of the Enoch. Um, and Enoch... Uh, uh, supposedly uh, wrote the uh, ineffable 
word of God, God's the secret name, the correct pronunciation of um, uh, Yahweh <laughs> and, or Jehovah, and on a gold triangle plate that's encrusted with jewels buried under eight eight arches under the ground in a vault. So whenever we had money pictures people, on one of our previous discussions. Yeah, we had a if you want to look at yeah, yeah, yeah you can our previous discussions, uh, we talked about it somewhat. Um, we'll talk about it again when we get to the um, coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. So that's that, but um, on the other part of Cheryl's comment um, that Hiram uh, was a Mason, not a Mason, uh, Mason again, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the idealist fallacy that people uh, remain constant throughout their life. Uh, it's a little bit too much to expect, but which you, uh, I find this totally ironic since I'm here with Carrie, who was a Mormon theist, then an atheist, but now is a theist again. <laughs> who said that? You. I said that? No, I said that just now. Just to, to me, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so Cheryl's saying uh, Hiram was a Mason, not a Mason. Now he's a Mason again. That doesn't make any sense to her. I see where you're. And I'm with. saying, well, we're sitting. I find that ironic since I'm here with you, and you were a the Mormon theist, then an atheist for three years. You said four. Four years. Now he's a theist of a different kind. Well, I'm a seeker. You know about seekers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So but, you know. I, I, I and then, be in that analogy. That's interesting. Yeah. Then we also have my friend Don Bradley. Yeah, Don Bradley. Yeah, yeah he man. might be on soon. Might be on soon. That would be nice if he came on. Yeah, um, I, I think he will be on the show eventually. Yep. He was that a believing sense. Mormon who became a post Mormon for many years and then was rebaptized. Yeah. Yeah. Good old Don. And he's not the only one. Anyway, Dan must rest the evidence to prove his point. I think the evidence is being overstated to prove a point. Cheryl says, you are holding on so tightly onto, you are holding so tightly onto the idea that the Book of Mormon is anti-Masonic that you can't see the other side. And that my, my response is, I don't, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. The only thing that matters is evidence and arguments. These are not usually the words of a scholar, but of a believer of some kind. Sort of like saying, you are holding on to your Methodism to, uh, so tightly that you can't see the truth of Mormonism. <laughs> it's, it's ad hominem. When you take the focus off the evidence and arguments and put it on me, that you're, that's an ad hominem distraction um cheryl says you are the one trying to harmonize like i say they're trying to harmonize the book of mormon to fit into their uh, scheme of just Smith being this great masonic restorer right. occam's razor would say that hiram joined the lodge and stayed there <laughs> that, that's a misuse of occam's razor the theory that explains most of the evidence with the least qualifications. Your spurious masonry theory is an ad hoc attempt to explain away disconfirming evidence. So you have to make the Book of Mormon harmonize with the Joseph Smith as the great Masonic restorer of the word that got lost again. Uh, Cheryl says, if we didn't have the Nauvoo Lodge, we would not know that Hiram was a Mason. But we do have the Nauvoo Lodge. So remember that comment? That that was, uh, so I was using it as, uh, you know, we are sure that uh, we, have, we have a really good idea that 
that Hiram is our Hiram mentioned in the Mount Moriah Lodge because we have this other record that confirms that he was a member of the record. But if you didn't have that Nauvoo thing and you just had the not the record, you would have two Hirams and you would wonder, did Hiram ever join the Masons? <laughs> right? I and mean, you'd have two Hirams in the area and you, you would say, well, you know, um, it could be one out of two choices. But now I've eliminated that somewhat and uh, maybe it is him. So um, anyway, I was just are using that as an argument. And sure. we do, we do have, and for, so with Joseph Smith Sr., all we have is the Canandaigua Lodge says Joseph Smith Sr., you know, or Joseph Smith, sorry. And if you had some other record in some other lodge somewhere besides the Canandaigua Lodge and it said Joseph Smith, what would you do? And um, we don't have any other independent record that Joseph Smith Sr. was ever a Mason that would bolster our uh, conclusion that, that Joseph Smith in the Canandaigua record is our Joseph Smith Sr. <clears throat> so I was arguing that we do have it. Uh, it was hypothetical. It's not an argument. It's not a way of proving anything. It's just uh, right. using a, 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 this as an example to help understand why i'm seeing certain things as being weak um right, right. well you're doing a historian's review that, that's the idea yeah. where we stand what the real status of the argument is at this moment uh right. that is what is called a straw man fallacy dan that's what she says i think she was talking about um um when I say that uh, Method Infinite is too positive about Joseph Smith Sr. being our Joseph Smith Sr. in that Canandaigua record, and I said that they said it without qualification. Right. She says I, that I think that's what she's referring to. That was a straw man argument. I honestly can't remember where you were. Yeah. Going at, but, but if that yeah. is it, then the thing is, is that I have the knowledge, acknowledge that they, did they acknowledge nine Joseph Smiths, although that one sentence seems a little too strong. Um, so, um, Cheryl says, yes, Claire, meaning Claire Barris, remember Claire Barris in our discussion of uh, the faculty of Abrac being in the... Um, uh, that was a great episode, by the way. Leland. The Leland manuscript. Right. Um, so uh, Claire, Claire's article shows that the forged Leland manuscript entered into Masonic, the Masonic world and was used by 19th century Masons who did seek to win the faculty of Abrick. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and Masons didn't do that. It... Only if you take George F. Fort's 1881 interpretation, where he tried to uh, explain the lost word as the same as winning the faculty of Abrek, which they're, they're not the same. And the Leland manuscript never made that connection between th the faculty of Abrek. It never explained what the faculty of Abrek was. It left it up to your imagination. But nobody, no Masons were seeking the faculty of Abrek. And, um, and we know what the faculty of Abrek is. It was, a you know, an amulet uh, to right. promote good health. So. Um, health in the navel, marrow, and the bones type thing. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, George F. Four in his 1881 book is speculating and trying to make the Leland manuscript, and he believes it's real, not a forgery, connect with masonry, and this is how he explained it. And we have no record of anyone doing that before this, that at least the, the authors of Method Infinite have no source 
that, that shows Masons doing this before 1881. And Barris said that that's why he didn't refer to this uh, uh, Fort's book, 1881 book, because it was too late and he was being more careful. Um, it's wild speculation on Fort's part, though. And if you have other sources, I'll be happy to entertain them. Now, um, <laughs> that's it for my comments to their comments. And so there's a kind of a slow motion dialogue here going on, not being no, ignoring them, but right. it would be too hard to explain all this detailed stuff with debate at the same time. So right. debate. Well, the, debate the slow motion dialogue, later. I honestly think, is the best way for all of it. There's a lot of information here to absorb. Yeah. And it's all so fascinating. And there is a lot of little pits and curves and turns, details in the historical records that take a lot of digesting and sifting. And that's where the value comes in from these authors of this book who have done obviously an enormous amount of work and your historical detective work and, and others. So this, I, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying this immensely and we will see other sides. I have, yes. uh, I have uh, Cheryl coming on in two weeks and I also have Clinton Bartholomew, another past master, uh, a former master Mason. I shouldn't say former, but a past master of his lodge. He'll be here on December 18th, I believe. And we're going to talk about, uh, actually we're going to talk about the, uh, the cipher, the Akbar cipher and his discovery yeah, of the Adamic language characters in the papyri and where they're coming from. So there's some fun stuff coming up, but see, we're getting all different kinds of approaches and I am discovering that more and more people are wanting to find the, the different views and approaches. So that that's the, I'm hoping eventually to, uh, What's his, uh, Jeff Bradshaw. I would like to have Jeff Bradshaw on this show oh, yeah. to see his interpretation of Masonry and Mormonism. And mm -hmm. so this, this is a ball for all of us to try to get as many options and ideas and, and see how history works. I know I majored in history, but that was back in 1995 when I got my BS and it was pure BS when I got it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So it's it's so fun to get all this information and ins and outs. Yeah, it can be intricate and yes, it can be detailed, but that is the essence of history after all. That's where our probabilities will be measured. So fun stuff, man. So uh, how much, do we, we got about a half an hour. We can probably cover the first vision. Okay, you wanna, you wanna cover it? Let's do it. Yeah, I'm gonna go to... Uh... That's the last one. <laughs> oh, man. Did I do that again? Sorry. Mine, mine was 65. Okay. Hold on. That's that's it. Okay. Okay. My numbers don't apply anymore. Well. Sorry. sorry. You, you keep me on track with this. So. Okay. Uh, no, there's one before, just before that, that has a typo in it. But. <laughs> Uh-oh. It, it has the question. Not, that's that's going the wrong direction. Not him. Go did back. I, did Go I, back. I, there you are. No. Oh, is that it? No. No. There. No. <laughs> that's not it. No. No. That that was the last one. Hold it. That's the same one I had. What was the one just before that? No, that's not it. Okay, we'll just start there. Sorry. The other one just says, the other one just, I'll just read it. Uh, All do, right. do first vision, oh, maybe that other one was it, but do first vision accounts mirror the Masonic rite of illumination? So the question is, uh, there, chapter four is what we're going to be discussing and they try to say that Joseph Smith wrote his first vision accounts with 
the initiation ceremony, the first degree masonry, <clears throat> entered apprentice, <clears throat> uh, show with with uh, that ceremony in mind as he's writing and telling his first vision story. Uh, and uh, my uh, interpretation of what's going on here is it's actually them who are making these very general. There we are. Sorry, I uh, I accidentally exited the studio. I swiped two fingers across my pad accidentally. Do my first vision I'm account so mirror and, and, and ignore that misspelling there. The Masonic what? right of a lunar. Mirror. This slide is as true as far as it is spelled correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's correct in my notes, but somehow I screwed it up when I made the slide. Um, anyway, okay. do do they mirror this Masonic rite of illumination or the initiation? It's coming from the darkness into the light. So, and we're going to discuss the ceremony and... Joseph's first vision, and, and uh, so coming from the darkness into the light, you know, is, is a metaphor that's going to be used by a lot of different groups, people, you know, it's the age of enlightenment, it's, you know, uh, yeah. so. Ancient Mithraism used it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, all, it's through the whole Bible, it's everywhere you know, this metaphor of dark from darkness into light. And, and you know, they, they, they even quote in the ceremony, Masonic ceremony, you know, God said, let there be light, and there was light, kind of. And, you know, uh, I'm not that impressed, put it that way, with the parallels. There's better, better, um, sources for uh joseph smith's first vision and we're going to look at those um i personally liked him i'm just saying that i thought it was cool but yeah. that's just me okay so that's your version so well, well what, what you'll see one of the major problems is that they don't show a critical uh knowledge of joseph smith's first vision in the various accounts and okay. they, and they give the standard story of Joseph Smith's first vision that fits this. And so, to it seems it would be appealing to uh, a believing Mormon right. that has this. They think the first vision is is really set, and all the different versions actually tell the same thing, but different parts of it. And it's, that's so, not the so way. Your, your approach is that they might. They're probably harmonizing the first vision too much in order yeah. to make appear Masonic. Do, do I have that right? Yeah, that. And yeah, then they take the Masonic yeah. one and they make it too so general that oh. it would fit almost anything. And then they read into both things. Okay. Well, I reread we'll, we'll this see. afternoon. We'll and that was the impression I kind of got a little bit more. This is like the fourth time I've read through this wonderful chapter, but I kind of got the impression that, well, you know, I'm, they appeared to me to be harmonizing somewhat the first vision. They certainly didn't demonstrate all of the differences and, yeah. and, and emphasis. And, and so, yeah, I, I, okay. Yeah. Let's keep going with your point. I'm I'm kind of with you on this at this point. And things that that were invented later. Um, right. Anyway, um, so the next slide is the the one we've seen before. Uh oh, hold on. This one. Okay. Uh, first vision and and evangelical conversion narratives, and these are two articles that they don't refer to. Um, the good Neil, article. Neil Lambert and Richard. Craycroft literary form and the historical yeah. understanding. Joseph Smith's first vision, and this is like in 1980, Journal of Mormon History. Uh, also, Christopher C. Jones, The Power and Form of Godliness, Methodist Conversion Narratives, and Joseph Smith's First Vision. 
<laughs> oh, no, I don't have that second one. I've read the Lambert Crockcroft. That's an excellent yeah. one, literary form. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I've got a new one to look up now. So we're Who's talking that? about the first vision as a literary form. Sure. sure. Uh -huh. And it's there's a well-established scholarship in the first vision that these authors just totally ignore as if there hasn't been any scholarship on the first vision uh, before they're, you know, drawing parallels between uh, the first vision stories and the um, initiation ceremony that it goes from darkness to light. And, and very generally, Joseph Smith goes from darkness to light in, in his first vision. But... Um, so uh, th these are two important articles that should have been discussed or something. I don't know. Uh, maybe it would have nuanced their treatment or something. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, the there's no connection between the two things. Um, okay. Okay, next... Uh, Slide Hopefully is this one right. Okay, we got Charles Finney. You know, let's see. That's yeah, the one this this is it. Um, this is from uh, Neil Lambert and Richard Craycroft's article, and mm -hmm. this is what they say: When Joseph Smith Jr. began to shape his recollections of his momentous vision into a narrative. It is natural that he would turn to a traditional form of spiritual autobiography familiar to him and those around him. In several religious revivals in which Joseph Smith and his neighbors had participated, they doubtless heard many accounts of conversions of souls who had strayed, but who through grace were born again. So, uh, and I've argued that it, actually it was uh, Joseph Smith's uh, first vision was a born again experience that has been um, developed into this to a an encounter with Jesus physically there and then the father and Jesus in 1838 calling him more or less in, in an, uh, it was more of a developmental call. theology through the years with the yeah. explaining of the story that yeah. too and that's being ignored in the in the method infinite is it's ignoring the development of the Godhead. Uh, it's ignoring the uh, development that the first vision was a personal experience of forgiveness of sins and then became in 1838 a calling, uh, condemning all the churches and you're being Get called. To start a new church and all. Yeah. Or it's, re it's reflecting what has already been accomplished. Um, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> we'll go to the next. Oh, Charles Finney, let me say one thing that they do um, mention Charles Finney. Okay. And, okay. and um, they quote out of a book written by Mark Crane, Car <laughs> Carnes. <laughs> Sorry, writer Mark Carnes has shown that Finney used the or ordinal ritual of masonry to describe his religious conversion experience. And then they quote a paragraph out of the book. Much as the infinite, uh, oh, excuse me, much as the initiate circumambulated the temple, Finney set himself in motion to find places to pray. Well, this is uh, Carnes making an analogy to Finney's uh, being uh, lost and going through confusion before he prays. And he's, and it's this author that's making the analogy, not, not Finney. And it's the only it's the only thing that they show out of the initiation ceremony that these authors don't talk about any other parallel. Oh, being because used. they're trying to tie it in with the circumambulation with yeah, the, and that's a that's in the lodge. 
Yeah. So when they come in, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, okay. We'll then go we through go through the steps. We'll go through the steps and see what they think is a parallel. <clears throat> but this statement on page 66 about Finney. Finney did no such thing. It's this modern author doing the same thing that they're doing. So, and not, and he only shows one thing. He only said like this and made one comparison and that was it. He didn't right. go through detail like these, um, the authors of Method Infinite are gonna go through in detail. This other author that they're using only mentions one thing uh, that they quote. Okay, so our ne next slide. Christopher Jones uh, taught, is inspired by D. Andrews, the Methodist and Revolutionary America, the shaping of an evangelical culture. And this is on uh, Christopher Jones. He wrote a book about it, but he also wrote a summary in Juvenile Instructor that's online. Right. Um, and in there, he says, according to D. Andrews, there are certain distinct features of Methodist conversion narratives, though she does not explicitly list all of these features. I have identified eight common characteristics in a survey of these accounts, though not all conversion narratives contain all nine features because he has one that he doesn't talk about because it has nothing to do with Mormons, really. And um, as um, each characteristic can be found in multiple narratives by Methodist converts, as well as in Joseph Smith's first vision. And we know Joseph Smith was, said he was partial to the Methodists. Right. right. And that's because the Methodist uh, revivals were very highly uh, emotional events and... Uh, uh, it had physical manifestations of the reception of the spirit and vision. People had visions. People experienced the falling power. So Joe Smith was attracted to those kinds of things, the very things that Asel Smith hated <laughs> because they were ir because they were irrational, right? Uh -huh. That's why he wanted wanted uh, Lucy and Joe Smith Senior to read Thomas Paine's uh, The Age of Reason. Now, now, in your article, if I remember right. And I'm giving my memory away here because I'm, yeah, you know, I'm the backyard professor. Mm -hmm. uh, in your article in Line Upon Line, the early Mormon concept of God, there were there were ideas in the Book of Mormon explanation of God that somewhat fit with the Methodists, as well as the Arminians, but the Presbyterians didn't like it much. If I remember right, you mentioned. That. I'm just well it's a it's a little involved and off the our topic but it it is but I'm just <laughs> saying the it, method the book of Mormon is not uh, uh theologically consistent and no, it's, it's ambiguous uh, just are... wasn't a theologian and yeah. so there you can read most of the passages in it would be uh, familiar to most Protestants but there were some passages that are unique and don't relate to the New Testament or the Bible. Uh, and that tells you what Joseph Smith was really thinking. And yeah. it goes, yeah. it's, it would be a type of theolo theology called modalism. There you go. That's the word. And yep. that's where God actually comes down and dwells in the flesh yeah, and that that was considered a heresy uh, in the early Christian Church. Um, so, but that's a whole another topic, and I know uh, so. that I'd be happy to discuss it in a, another time. But so here, um, it's a great article. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next slide and see some All of right. these traits. Let's do that. that. <clears throat> okay. So these traits, characteristics of Methodist conversion narratives, and uh, there's eight of them. Here they are. Per, there's a personal crisis, concern for salvation, meaningful passage of scripture, 
camp meeting or secluded place mm-hmm. where where the conversion takes place prayer mm-hmm. in uncharacteristic manner praying in a way like out loud for joseph smith <clears throat> The devil or dark force attempts to stop the person from praying. Uh, a, the convert is rescued by a redemption experience. Vision of heavenly things, leaving a uh, convert in a state of inexpressible joy. And the most important one. A desire to join a Methodist church. Um, What's what? <laughs> So Joe Smith was inclined, anyway. At least his mom was. No, she was, a pres- was she was Presbyterian. Oh, that's right. That's right. The Presbyterian. Inclined to the Methodist. Correct. After yes. Al- after Alvin's death in 1823, so hey, she uh, was Chris converted Wilson, during the Chris the revival. Wilson, where did you get this list? This, oh, this list uh, is sort of I don't know. I think I reworded some of it to make it more simple yes. but it, uh, it was it was on that uh article and in juvenile instructor online um 19th of december 2007 so you can go there and christopher jones uh summarize it is summarizing his book right right okay okay so um so the next. So, th- so this is why they compare it to a regular uh, conversion narrative that was v- familiar. Just Smith trying to convert other Christians, not just Masons out there. He isn't aiming to convert a bunch of Masons. He's right. he's trying to convert the you know sectarians. Um, okay. okay uh, so the next slide. Okay, so it's. Okay, here we go. This is searching for the light. Yeah. So the I got this summary, these little uh, kind of bullet points in a way, uh, from Method of Infinite on several pages. They it's kind of spread out. So um, on page sixty six, they talk about this cable toe. and the cable toe is the rope around the neck, and the hoodwink is the blindfold. And this is how you're brought in to the lodge. And there's like three knocks. Because because you're in the dark. You're in the dark. Meaning also uh, mentally and spiritually, you're in the dark also. You're lost and confused. Yeah. Okay. Um, And that you're being led. And uh, there you have three knocks. And after that is a prayer circumambulation or walk around the lodge, walking around the lodge and you end up at the altar. The worshipful master is uh, there. It's at the east end of the lodge. This says prayer. I'm following what they say or kneel in prayer, they say. But there's no prayer. There's no prayer at this point. But there's a covenant to keep the secret once you learn it. And then you're given the secrets and you've and then you take a blindfold off and you're in the light. And you're in the light. Uh-huh. And even Morgan talks about this. You're like shocked because you're in the, your pupils are blown, you know, and yeah, yeah. Be, because it, you, you all of a, you all of a sudden are put into the light and it's shocking to some people. So one somebody wrote about one somebody fainting. <laughs> Yeah, during it but um so th- this is what they give a like a broad definition uh that they're going to try to compare the first vision to so right. with the cable toe symbolizing the darkness and an impotence of ignorance the seeker is brought into the door of the lodge where the there's three knocks and asks for light once admitted the candidate's first ritual act is to kneel for the benefit of prayer as a token of the trust in God's power to lead him through the darkness of an unregenerate world. Alluding to this uh, moral sojourn, the candidate is led in a circum- circumambulation of, a, of the lodge 
At the apex of his journey, he finds himself at the altar of masonry, where he is placed under a covenant and brought to the light. He then receives the symbolic secrets of the degree, the light or knowledge that he came to the door seeking. Then on page 77, uh, it says the Masonic candidate is challenged as he circumambulates the lodge representing the world. He is led to kneel in prayer, which isn't, there's no prayer, following which he is presented with a lambskin apron. Described as an emblem of innocence, the apron symbolizes covering for sin, typifying the atonement of Christ, and suggests the Christian Freemason to the Christian Freemason, the equally symbolic coats of skin provided by Adam, Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, to the Christian, this is a private interpretation in a way. What the authors imagine Christians imagine, not something that is expressed in the, in the uh, ceremony itself. Then on page 78, um, in the first degrees of masonry, the candidate uh, does not pray himself. So as I mentioned, it's not really a prayer. It says kneel in prayer, but it's not a prayer. Rather, others pray in his behalf until he is raised to the master mason degree. Then uh, whoops. Go. Oh, yeah. Okay, I already read that. All right. So that's kind of their um what you, you get an idea of uh, going through this ceremony, and then now they're going to um, make some parallels. Okay. That uh, slide. And that's where I was talking about Carnes, and they quote, oh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. quote Carnes um, about the circumambulating the temple was like Finney, who set himself in motion to find places to pray. Well, this is, like I said, this is Carnes, the author, making an analogy. It's just a writing technique. It's not any uh, uh, sustained uh, analysis like they're doing that's putting, comparing Finney, or Finney never did it himself. They say Finney used the ordinal, rit ordinal ritual of masonry to describe his religious conversion experience. That's not in this quote anyway. Okay. It's the author making the comparison, not Finney. So they're what I I gather is they're trying to use that as justification for what they're going to do, which right. to me doesn't doesn't do that. Um, then um, so um, next slide. Okay, this is on page 67 and continue, continued, my quotes continued on page 69. By the time of the earliest telling, it appears the story had developed. I think that's 1832 they're talking about. The, the story had developed a fixed structure. In each of the accounts, the elements are arranged in precisely the same order an order mirroring the Masonic rite of illumination. From the very beginning, the future prophet stepped into this Masonic pattern. So that's a pretty big statement, but in my view, it's never uh, sustained in this thing. I mean, what, what order are they talking about? Bro a broad order of confusion, prayer, then a vision? It's a story. How could the story change in order, though? Could it be? Could there be? Could there be another order to this story? Um, when they make a statement like that, it implies that it could be in a different order. But how can you take a, the story, simple story, and 
change the order of anything. You can't put the vision first. But difficult to maintain this assertion, though vague as it is, the, their assertion is vague, when not all the elements are given. So up above, you can see this is James B. Allen's chart from his 1970 oh, okay. article. And it shows all the elements and all the stories and the dots represent that in each of the stories above the 1832 account, 1835, you know, right across 1838 is the main official one that we all know so well. And then the different other peoples. Yeah. And so there's so many, there's more elements to the story than what the method infinite wants to discuss. And, but they're going to mainly discuss the official account. They do mention 1832 account, but okay. the story he says the story has been fixed and it, how can it, you discuss a fixed story when there's so many elements being interchanged from all the different tellings. And um, it also ignores the fact that much of the story is invented later because we're talking about 1838 and 1832, the motivation for praying is different. Um, right, right. It's uh, in 1832, it's uh, Joe Smith has already concluded that all the churches are false. We'll, we'll see, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, uh, anyway, so, and it contains contradictions and evolves over time in various different ways. So the the Godhead hadn't been fixed by 1832. It hadn't been fixed by 1916 either. <laughs> I, know. I mean, that went way up. I'm doing a series of podcasts on that right now. Yeah. On my other channel. Yeah. It's fascinating. So, so the, the story's developing. There is, a, after 1838, though, uh, the accounts after 1838, when you get to like retellings of the 1838 account, yeah, basically, solidify. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. when it looks solidified. Yes, uh, but you have 1835. You know, one appears and then one appears after that. Uh, right. You know, and there's all various different elements when you really analyze all the different accounts and all the parts of it, not right. in just in vague generalities. Uh, that you yeah. can make these very loose connections to to almost anything if you're willing to do that. So uh, I, I'm more I'm more uh, um, convinced by the uh, evangelical narrative angle than I am the Masonic parallels. They okay. seem again they seem contrived. Um, so, uh, oh, whoops. Sorry, I hit the button. You ready to go to this one? Okay, well, yeah, you can leave it there. Um, on a, page 67, they say that by it's, they talk about its being um, solidified. Uh, as in Charles Finney's case, Smith chose to clothe the, his experience in Masonic garb, implying his exposure to the ritual from an early date. Well, uh, you know, are they talking about 1832 or are they talking about 1820? Um, so uh, exposure to, it implies that he had exposure to the ritual at an early date kind of implies to me that they're saying that in 1820, uh, Joseph Smith or knows Masonic ritual. And exactly. Well, he was rewriting it in the 1838 era. Maybe they're saying, <clears throat> do you think they might be saying that by that time he had been exposed to some of the Masonic ritual before he was a Mason in 18, what was it, 1842? Something like that when he became a Mason. So yeah, maybe, maybe that's what they're trying to say is in the later years, by that time he had been exposed. Well, you mean before, well, before Nauvoo? Yeah, he's reading more masonry into his later tellings of the story. It could, it could. Based on his current experience and understanding. I don't, that's kind of how I took it. That's why I was asking. So, 
But I do see your point. Yeah, yeah. But it says implying his exposure. So they're using the first vision as evidence that Joseph Smith has early exposure to masonry, not just that they're so certain of these parallels that it's now become evidence that Joseph Smith has exposure to masonry early. So, uh, you know, I believe he did. I mean, right, right. But, but the first vision is not really going to help you get there. Uh, anyway, so okay. uh, the next slide is that uh, our darkness, hoodwinked, confusion, parallel. So right. this, this is what Joseph supposedly is uh, copying. I mean. Was he really confused about religion? If he was, he didn't need to follow any Masonic influence. I mean, he he was confused. Or or are they implying that he's making it up and and using masonry to make up the story? So there's a little um, confusion as to what is being implied here. Well, that's interesting. We're on that subject, confusion. So, (laughs) no. So, so he's not he's not confused in the 1832 account about which church is true. Was he was he confused about which was true? So, you get to the next uh, slide after this. Oh yeah, yeah. See, there's an authentic revival painting right there for the audience. This is what it looked like. See that guy right? Oh, you can't see my... See the guy with his hands up? Yeah, he's doing a mason yeah. sign. On the, he's given the mason sign on that <laughs> pedestal. All right, the next one. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Yeah, I, you know what? I'm glad I held off. I, I was going to start asking you about this, but good. You're going to cover this. All right. Here yeah. we go. This is this is one of the uh, who was it that was it Marquardt who uh, wrote that book inventing Mormonism with Wesley Walders on this yeah. subject, and then yeah. Richard Bushman tried to uh, get in on the object. And my impression of that uh, exchange was it with Walters? Walters yeah. just beat the snot out of Bushman. I, I was shocked because I thought Bushman did a really yeah. good response and walter's comeback was even better and i'm going whoa wait a minute did i just mm-hmm. see i was a i was an apologist at this point and i was kind of reeling i was thinking my gosh did did an anti-mormon get the best of a fabulous mormon historian on this so so thank you for bringing this up okay let's go to this this is this is really good <laughs> this is a whole subject in itself but yeah, um, really <laughs> so, <laughs> there's no there was no revival and no confusion in 1820. So there's no revival in 1820. There's no confusion in 1820. So Method Infinite, when they talk about it's the same order of things, well, if the vision occurred in 1820, uh, it most likely uh, followed the um, 1832 account that Joe Smith was really what already concluded that all the churches were false and was looking for salvation. And Jesus appears or tells him that he's saved through faith. And um, so uh, the 1838 account says so great was the confusion and strife among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person as young as I was and so unacquainted with men and things to come to any certain conclusion who was right and who was wrong. But in 1832, by searching the scriptures, I found mankind did not come to the Lord, but they were had apostatized from the true and living faith. And there were no society, there was no society or denomination that built upon the Gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. Now, um, so when did Joseph Smith become um, confused about religion? Uh, Not, I would say after his leg was operated on. <laughs> Sorry. Well, 
it, so in 1820, uh, Joseph Smith basically uh, agreed with both parents. Both parents believed that there was no true church. Right, right, right. After Alvin's death in 1823, Lucy started attending the uh, revivals and joined the Presbyterian Church and started pressuring other members to join. And three of her older siblings did join, including Hiram Smith. And so yeah. um, that's when Joseph Smith became confused about religion. Okay. When the family got divided. And right. the minister at Alvin's funeral implied that he had gone to hell because he hadn't oh, been baptized. Right. And that ticked off Joseph Sr. Right. He, he basically flipped the minister off and said, kiss off, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, as far as that goes. <laughs> so here you are, Joseph Smith Sr. And you wow. and you have you've had dreams about the apostate condition of Christianity in the religious world. And then you go to this funeral and the minister said Alvin has gone to hell because he's yeah. unbaptized. All of Smith's children were unbaptized because Joseph and Lucy Smith were unchurched. Right. Lucy had been baptized, but hadn't joined any specific church. That was the condition of her baptism. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so they didn't baptize their children. And then, so the minister says Alvin gone to hell. Joseph Sr. got ticked off, and Lucy later joins that minister's church. What, yeah. what do you think that's going to do to your marriage, you know? <laughs> it's going to cause grace and peace throughout New York. <laughs> that, so, that's what Joseph Sr. probably got so mad. He said, oh, to hell with this. I'm going to go dig for some gold. Come on, Joe, grab your peepstone. Let's get out of here. <laughs> right. So... Uh, and that's what basically Joseph Smith does is uh, uphold his father's dreams, right. his dream visions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that and, was what his vision. And yeah. tells Lucy that her church is false. There's false, yep. And saves Alvin in a church that they could all join. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, that's my thesis of my biography uh, in broad terms. Um, so anyway, so what about this order that the, the method infinite authors were talking about in the exact same order that the first vision has become solidified, uh, and that it copied, um, uh, Masonic, uh, initiation ceremony when the facts, they, they're being changed and moved around all the time. And not according to um, Masonic lore, but according to the needs of his church that he's just founded. Right. So in 1832, uh, we ha he doesn't conclude all churches are false. And Jesus this is after he, his was two years old. Yeah. It, well, and he might have been 21. I mean, uh, 20, 1821. He might have right. been 15 instead of 14. Um, which they make a big deal out of his age later on being uh, 14, you know, uh, according to some kind of Masonic uh, tradition. And so, <clears throat> so in 1832, there's no confusion. He has a vision of Jesus. He's converted to Jesus and saved through faith. All those who believe in me shall be saved. That was the end of the vision. It was a personal vision about his salvation. In 1838, it's been transformed into an institutional vision. It's all the, all the creeds are an abomination in his sight, you know. And so they're all false. And um, Joseph Smith said he didn't, he didn't know what, uh, what church was true. And he was confused and he was and he was inspired by Reverend George Lane in giving a sermon on which church is true during the revival, which was 1824-25, and not by Masonic uh, passages that the Method Infinite authors quote. They quote a 
knocking at the door. They quote several different passages uh, that are in Masonic ceremonies uh, for questioning. And but Joe Smith said that uh, through Oliver Cowdery and later through William Smith, Joe Smith said that it was Reverend George Lane and his sermon on which church is true that inspired him to pray. And the, the text of the sermon was James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. You know, that, that passage. So, um, so it's all coming from the revivals, not from Methodism or, or I mean, uh, or masonry. masonry. Um, so let's see, where, where, where are we? Uh, Sorry, I snipped on to the next slide. Oh, I hope I jumped the no, gun. that's okay. Bound by an unseen power. So this is where we get to. Uh, so he's hoodwinked uh, and blind. And, and the, hoodwink, the hoodwink represents uh, confusion and darkness and all that stuff. Right. Um, the cable toe is you're being led away. Yeah. So why would Joseph Smith um of uh, design his own history after masonry parts of masonry that he would later say was corrupt and not pure it's this is spurious masonry he's he's formulating according to these authors his history after the spurious part of masonry you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Now, now um, how do you figure? How do you figure he's taken it after the spurious part of masonry? I'm not okay, well, that. yeah, well, uh, the Hiram Abbott story is is the spurious part. Okay, okay. okay. So, and sure. this especially, bound by an unseen power, likened to the cable toe. Okay, and in the Book of Mormon, there's this passage. And there are also secret combinations, even as in times of old, according to combinations of the devil. And the, and he leadeth them by the neck with a flaxen cord until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever. Right. So some interpreters have interpreted this as um, uh, the cable toe. Well, it's not just modern interpreters that see the cable toe in this passage. And some Masons have commented on this, but mm -hmm. as as early as um, uh, 1830, this connection had been made, probably by Oliver Cowdery in Northern Ohio, as he was uh, the main speaker, uh, and it was reported in the newspapers as saying various things. Uh, he even said that Lehi landed in Chile. Oh, you not know. when I said that in 1830. 1830. Yes, 1830. <laughs> uh, they say, Oliver Cowdery, that Lehigh landing in Chile at the 32nd degree parallel thing is goes back to that time, probably. Anyway, and that's a that's a, something I'm going to cover in a video sometime. But yeah, the Auburn Free Press, as you see, uh, or Philadelphia album originally. Well, it's. It's the Auburn, New York Free Press, as reprinted in the Philadelphia album, 18th of December, 1830, reporting on the missionaries, what they were saying in northern Ohio and converting all those people in northern Ohio, um, says the Book of Mormon predicts, we understand, almost all events which have come to pass, such as the American Revolution, etc., and that there shall be secret societies and that men should be led on to destruction as by a rope of flax said to mean cable toe. Cable toe. See, there you go. There's the Masonic connection, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> it's an anti-Masonic connection. But oh, um, technicality. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so they at a very early time, he, in 1830, they're connecting this cable toe it, it, with this prophecy in the Book of Mormon in a very negative light. Why would he try to pattern his history after this? 
you know. Interesting um, point. So it's more, it fits better with the evangelical um, uh, autobiographies of many ministers as they were being called to uh, be ministers. They would go through this same pattern of conversion and they would have visions, actually visions of God or Jesus or both. Well, you, you know? showed that real well in your Seekers book. I, I was really impressed with the amount of uh, information you put in that on, on Joseph Smith's first vision not being unique. And then what was real interesting is, uh, who was it? Bushman. I think it was Richard Bushman in the beginnings of Mormonism found even more materials on that because I think he was following your lead. And so that came out pretty strong. His first vision actually wasn't even unique really so that pattern was out there in the countryside so yeah sorry i don't mean to toot your own horn for your book well, well thank you that was a terrific book that one really i liked that one very much so yeah and the priest uh, the the yeah. seekers and the uh, anticipation for restoration yeah yeah and yeah. how it comes right out of just Smith's family just Smith's lucy's yeah. brother jason mac jason mac Actually started a kind of com commune in New Brunswick of thirty Lucy's families. Brother. Yeah. Lucy's brother, Jason Mack, started. He was a leader, religious leader of a commune of thirty wow. families in New Brunswick. He came and visited uh, the Smiths in Vermont, and I believe had a very powerful impact on Joseph Smith Senior, huh. who whose whose visions reflected this those seeker ideals hey, lucy called him a seeker yeah in her, See, in just, her when history you, just when you think you know something about mormon history then you start reading dan vogler having him on your program and he shows you how bloody ignorant we all are isn't this awesome oh. come on you guys well, i'm glad to share i'm glad to share oh oh we love having you this is awesome. um okay last slide we're on our last slide yeah, hang in there everybody slide. Last hey, slide, I, I'm really sad because I'm enjoying this immensely, although we've probably, yeah, last slide. Here we go. Let's so on the last we're... part, the last part, um, uh, let's see. You're, I can't remember what part of the book, but it's in this chapter on the Worshipful Master. Okay, so on page 82 uh, uh, is, uh, is I'm, um, getting there, I'm getting there. Is this statement? Oh, they're, they're talking about the Shekinah here too. Yeah, I, I thought that was kind of cool though. I like the Shekinah. The story. pillar of light. Yeah, the pillar of light. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. In the Old Testament, Jewish right. Hebrew name for the pillar of light, and George Oliver just happens to make a statement about it, but it doesn't really connect it uh, that much to make to an actual Mason the the ceremony that they're going to. Uh, refer to here but well, um he wouldn't have but the masons of his day would have saw that i think just so you know i'm just saying well you know there's no shekinah in the the lodge but um or reference to it but they this is why the the description that they give for when the mat the blindfold is taken off and the bright lights and stuff is right. a little, to me, a little over the top, uh, but uh, down in the third paragraph, it talks about the Masonic Rite of Illumination, the Shekinah, and then it says, in the in a column of light, so the, the, the candidate's kneeling at the altar, the worshipful master comes out of his seat, his throne, and approaches the altar and gives him instructions and things. Um, right. In a, so they take the mask off, or not mask, the the uh, blindfold, the hoodwink, right. uh, and in the column of light, the master of the lodge, dressed in glittering finery, which I don't know what they're trying to describe there, stepped down from the throne in the east to stand before the newly enlightened candidate. For Christian masons and I can only interpret this as their way of saying Christian Masons interpreted on their own, not 
by any instruction. Um, this master of the lodge was a representation of the Lord of the universe uh, uh, condescending from the divine throne to instruct individuals on earth. Now, then uh, on the next page, they say the worshipful master in the East represents God. And now I would like to have a source, a footnote. I cannot find uh, Masons interpreting the worshipful master as God. I find them as, in, 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 which is consistent with the uh, enlightenment ceremony is that the worshipful master represents the sun in coming out of the east, the light. Um, and the three great lights, sun, moon, and worshipful master. Um, Henry uh, Melville, 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 excuse me, ignorant learned right. or researches after the long lost mysteries of Freemasonry, London, 1863 says the, the worshipful master of every lodge symbolically personifies the sun at matins the sun rises in the east to enlighten the world as does the worshipful master rise in the east to enlighten his lodge in other degrees uh, the worshipful master can represent solomon king solomon well so i don't I haven't been able to find anything where Masons are saying the worshipful master in the East represents God coming down from his throne. So they're trying to make it sound like the first vision that, that Joseph Smith, his first vision. I mean, did it happen or didn't it really happen or what did God really, or what, how, what do they believe? Did God really appear to Joseph Smith or not? If he if really appeared, he didn't have to make it like Masonry. It, it would just, it would be them. Be making, yeah. It would be the authors of this book making the connection, not Joseph Smith. He's just describing what happened. Anyway, the dazzling, the column of light. Wait, where's this column of light in a lodge in the 19th century? Where, where is this column of light? Um, the glittering finery. I. <laughs> I find the guy wearing usually wearing dark a dark suit. Um, Step down from well, his during, throne. During, in the east. However, however, you have to understand during these ceremonies they did put on various different kinds of clothing, just so you know. Yeah, I know. They might um, have a. And there is a comment from Poppy's Jeff Day. The Shakima yeah. does get mentioned by name in Six Degrees, Most Excellent Master, preceding the Royal Arch. It also gets mentioned in other form as the Pillar of Fire in the Inner Apprentice and Fellowcraft. So, yeah. Just so you know. But not in the initiation. Huh? Not in, the, well, not in the initiation ceremony. And the way the authors connect it on page 82 is not directly with the ceremony itself it's only indirectly and um then they make the column of light the the worshipful master standing in the column of light and right. uh that's a little to me over the top okay uh, it's it's just contrived and trying to make things fit tighter it'll be interesting it's my opinion yeah, yeah. No, it's all good. This this is what okay. it's all about. Let's get everyone's view. So, so I think I'll so that's very interesting. Let that rest there. Okay. Man, dude, we have had a full evening of phenomenal information, man. <laughs> this has been fantastic. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh uh, thanks for all those excellent slides. You put a lot of work into this. I want to acknowledge that. I know now because I'm making slides for my programs, and sometimes these aren't easy to do. You got to do a lot of tracking, and you got to do a lot of you got to do a lot of measuring. And oh, it's too far that way. You got to do the oh. Uh. <laughs> so thank you for such a phenomenal presentation. Uh, we're going to close thank out you. for now. We'd like to keep going until midnight, but. 
We're yeah. afraid we wouldn't be able to do it, but Dan has enough uh, material to go till midnight 2023 on this same date, and we will have him back again soon. In the meantime, remember, you guys, have fun, do well, be good, sleep tight, make lots of friends, stay happy, and remember, life is good. We're going to head out of here. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for watching. Appreciate all your comments. Appreciate all your support. We will see you again very soon. Don't forget the new podcast on the backyardprofessor.org. Good listening stuff there. And I appreciate all your donations. A recurring donation, weekly or monthly, is always very helpful and very appreciative. And you guys are loved and awesome. And we'll see you very soon. We are out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs>